Alrighty, good evening everyone. If you would, find yourselves a seat, grab your hymn books and stand. We're gonna sing page number 44, We'll Work Till Jesus Comes. Page 44. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jeremy. Good to see you all this evening. Welcome to the services tonight. Let's have a word of prayer as we get things started. Brother Stephen, if you would, sir. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for all of your goodness to us, Lord, that, uh, that you give to us all the time. Lord, we thank you for, for tonight that we can all be here together, and Lord, we pray that you would Help us, Father, to take heed to how we hear your word, that we, would be, that we would let your word do what you want it to do in our hearts. Father, we pray that you would be with our pastor, that you fill him with your spirit, and help him to uh, help him to deliver the, the thought that you've placed on his heart for us tonight. Lord, we just pray that you would, you would work in our midst tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Please be seated. Just a couple of really quick announcements. Just want to remind everyone that uh, we have a fellowship at the end of the month. There's going to be a fifth Sunday uh, on the 29th. And what we'll be doing is having a supper, <coughs> excuse me, a supper after the morning service. And so we'll be, uh, of course, uh, it's 29th Sunday. So Sunday school, Sunday morning. Then we'll have a meal together and, uh, and then some preaching afterwards. I'm going to be having a couple different fellows preach that day. Uh, and then followed by some dessert and some probably some activities, some games and things like that. And so hope that you'll spend uh, the whole afternoon uh, with us. There'll be no evening service. We may end up being here uh, that late anyway, but I uh, hope that you'll come and join us on the 29th. And particularly for the fellas, we have men's prayer uh, uh, this Saturday, and that's at 7 o'clock here at the church, short devotion and time of prayer together. Uh, this Saturday. All righty, that's all the announcements that I have. We do have a new memory verse for the month of uh, January. If you would, Brother Stephen, come on up and let's go through our verse. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, if you all turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 again real quick. Take a look at our verse for January. Philippians chapter 1. And looking at verse number 6. Philippians 1, 6, if you're there, if you could read that nice and loud with me, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 1, 6. Anybody been working on that this week, wants to give it a go tonight, you're more than welcome to. But Dan? Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you 
will be forward to the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Got it. Good job. Good job. Anybody else? All right. Keep working on it, guys. Jeremy? All righty. Thank you, Stephen. Um, if you would, once again, stand. Turn to page number 46. Page 46, my Savior first of all. When my life's work is ended and I cross a swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know. on a second verse. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view the blessed face and the luster of his kindly bearing eyes. How my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepare me for the mansion in the sky. I shall know job you may be seated amen thank you brother jeremy thank you christian joy if you would please let's take our bibles and let's go to the book of acts chapter 27 we have been making our way through the book of acts uh, i think this is this is actually year number three that we've been working on the book of acts and uh, as you can see in your outline this is lesson number 103 i think there was a typo in in the uh outline a couple weeks ago i was looking at it uh, the other day was I was putting this uh, outline together and it ha I forget what it said. It was said like uh, 100 and uh, it didn't say two. I forget what it said. It was really bad. So uh, anyway, uh, it's, uh, you know, you know, autocorrect. You know how that works. Auto mess up. All right. Acts chapter 27 is where we're at. And we have been talking about Paul's ministry, his church planting ministry. And uh, he's at a place now, of course, where he's not, not church planting, but you know, he still has a tremendous impact uh, with the gospel. And we'll see that as he continues on, as he's making these last couple um, chapters here in the book of Acts, of course, uh, is, not is not church planting, but certainly there's some ministering going on. And uh, he's aboard ship, and as you can see in our outline, smooth sailing, uh, which is uh, during this uh, shipwreck that's going to be taking place here um, within a few, uh, or I guess our next lesson in there will be actually the shipwreck itself. But uh, if you would please, uh, Acts 27, uh, verse number 26 is where I'm going to start reading, just down through a couple of uh, verses. You can just remain seated, and um, I'm going to read uh, just a couple of verses here. Uh, How be it we must be cast upon a certain island. Of course, Paul is on ship. He's been, he had told them before they ever left out of the island of Crete uh, that, they, that it wasn't a good idea to sail. Uh, they ignored him, and off they went. They got caught in the storm called Eurachlodon, uh, and it's been battering the ship now for weeks uh, not looking good, uh, but God has given Paul 
a tremendous amount of confidence in the fact that he appeared to him in a vision that uh, he was going to be uh, safe and everybody on board actually was going to be safe. He's given them all those souls that were on board and uh, they'll be sailing to Rome and they're going to they're make it. And so he had told Paul prior to that in another place uh, that uh, he was going to make it to Rome. So Paul has a tremendous amount of confidence going into this and he's been relaying that confidence to the folks on board here. Uh, verse number 27, but when the 14th uh, night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, uh, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we uh, should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And I'm just going to stop right there. Let's pray and we'll pick up a couple more verses here in just a moment. Father, I just thank you, Lord. It's, uh, it's wonderful to know that even in the midst of some very difficult times and circumstances in our lives, Lord, that you have a plan for us. And Lord, um, uh, lest we be overcome with fear, Father, we have confidence of knowing that you have a better thing for us. And Lord, I ask you, please, even tonight as we discuss um, this particular circumstance and situation in Paul's life, that you'd help us to understand uh, where we can find some confidence in our lives. Uh, and Father, that uh, even in the midst of very difficult things, that our attention would be drawn uh, not just to ourselves, but to the needs of others. Now, Father, bless in the teaching of your word tonight. I ask you to uh, do wondrous things this evening. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, tonight we're going to start off by looking at uh, particular verse number 29. And, and um, uh, the reason I want to do that is because I don't know if you've ever heard any sermons preached about the four anchors off the back of the ship there uh, before they were shipwrecked. I, I, I'll be very straightforward uh, with you. I've heard a few different uh, preachers preach about the four anchors. And um, that, that's one of those things that's always uh, kind of perplexed me. So I don't, I'm not sure if you've ever heard those sermons before. Uh, the four anchors of the Christian life. Now, I took a, I took a few minutes just the other day and uh, just got online and, and typed uh, that particular verse of Scripture. And, at, and a type, you know, you can find anything if you do a Google search. Sermons on the four anchors of the Christian life. And, oh, my, I got a list big long list of, of, of sermons. Um, these, were, these were just three uh, that, I, that I came across. The four anchors of the Christian life based on this text of scripture, uh, the word of God, faith in Christ, uh, prayer, and providential care. Okay, So um, excellent sermon. I read through it, uh, bits and pieces, a lot of good things to say. I was on the phone the other day. Uh, actually, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a... Um, um, a video chat with uh, my good friend, uh, Pastor, former Pastor Tom Fryman. Now he's retired and living down south. And uh, he, he made a statement. He said, um, everything that is true is not necessarily truth. And that was an interesting statement that he made. And certainly uh, all four of those things are true. They're wonderful things, but um, they're not necessarily the truth of God's word based on that verse of Scripture. Here's another sermon for anchors of the Christian life. Faith in God, surrender, hope, and thanksgiving. All four of those things are true, but they're not based on the truth of God's word from Acts chapter 27, verse number 29. Here's four more. These are the four anchors of the Christian life. Uh, I didn't write down who wrote these sermons. I just pulled them offline. The presence of God, the promises of God, the providence of God, and the performance of God. All those things are true, uh, but they're not necessary. They don't, certainly do not come from this portion of Scripture in Acts chapter 27. Um, the only reason I bring that up is, and this is, I've had this discussion with several of the men here in the church, and we're talking about hermeneutics and hermeneutical principles and, and how to, you know, um, there's a difference between pulling um, something out of the scriptures and reading something into the scriptures. 
There's a lot of, a lot of fellows that have a sermon they want to preach, and they just try to look for a text they can preach it with. Okay? Um, th- again, it, there, that may be, all those things may be true, but they are certainly not the truth that's found in this text of Scripture. And, and so, you know, there's, uh, there's something to be said about finding what the Word of God says as compared to just coming up with something you want to say and finding a place in the Scripture where you can preach it at. So, I'm very, um, let me say it this way. I am much more careful today than I was many years ago in reference to this particular subject matter, and that is, uh, you know, if you would, finding a text and, and pitching a fit, um, trying, to ex- trying, to, trying to take truth from the Scriptures as compared to putting truth into the Scriptures. I try to be a lot more careful with that nowadays. I remember many years ago, and I think I've shared this probably a couple times over the last 20 plus years, but I remember as a young Christian hearing a sermon preached by a, a you know, guy gets up and preaches a sermon, that portion of Scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's, he's off, he's praying, he comes back, his disciples are asleep, and he says to them, can you not, you know, wa- can you not watch with me, uh, you know, an hour? And... Um, he preached a sermon that day about the necessity of praying an hour a day. Okay? Now, as a young Christian, I was, I was enthralled by that. That's just amazing. And he preached a wonderful sermon about, uh, about the, a structured prayer life and being able to pray for an hour. And I, as a young Christian, I'm going, yes, that's what I need to do. Because Jesus wants me to pray for an hour a day. And I tried that, and I failed miserably. And um, I'm not saying I don't have a prayer life, but I, I, after a while I realized, you know, this guy is just, he just pulled that off the top of his hat. I mean, that may be true, the fact that Jesus did say, you know, why can't you? Um, but that's not the truth of that text of Scripture. And so what, you, what you'll find so often is that the Word of God often ruins a lot of good sermons, okay? Because once you start, you know, actually looking at the text and say, what does this text actually say? And you realize, well, there's a lot of sermons out there that are not based at all on what the text says, just on the reference itself, and and, and they kind of wrap the sermon around particular words or phrases and did they throw four anchors off the back of that boat? Yes, they did. Okay, Christian, you were at the island. You went to the island of Malta. Did they, uh, they have a museum there, right? Now, I just want to say this. We had this discussion. I don't know, a couple years ago, uh, the Roman Catholic Church had had declared this particular part of the island where where Paul shipwrecked at, and it doesn't even come close to even jiving with the text of Scripture as far as locations or anything. So they they got it completely wrong. Okay. But uh, there's another bay on the other side of the island, which matches the description as Paul gives it in the, or Luke, as he's writing the text here, gives it in the text. And so they they did find anchors off that coast. And they're in a museum, right? You you, you took a picture, and I didn't get a chance to see. Yes, you did. And uh, so, and thank you. Uh, So the island of Malta is a pretty cool place. uh, And uh, um, what's the movie? The, The Popeye movie. With uh, many years ago, they filmed it there, and they built the, this big elaborate um, scene, and it's still there. So if you want to go to the island of Malta and see the Popeye scene there, you could check that out too. But there's a lot of great history on the island of Malta. Beautiful place. Um, you got to go. I didn't go. I get to see pictures. But uh, and mom gets a T-shirt, and you know that's it. So um, uh, anyway, they did physically throw the sh- anchors off the boat. But is that the four anchors of the Christian life? And again, it makes a great sermon, but it's not the truth. It's just there's no truth there. I have a couple things in your outline there, just asking some really simple questions, okay? And uh, that's based on verse number 29, you'll, you'll see there. Um, and fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast, um, uh, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Uh, the first question I have there, who are, who is, who's the they? Who's the they? Exactly right. 
This, okay, there's a lot of folks on this boat, and as far as I know, Paul the Apostle's there, Luke's there, one other fellow, and I can't remember his name. There's at least three believers on the boat. That's it, okay? The rest of the 200 and whatever number, I have it written down there for you, is um, uh, in the next, uh, next outline there. But um, the they is, is, the, is the shipmen. This is not Christians throwing anchors off of boats. This is, uh, these, are, these are unbelievers, Okay? So four anchors of the Christian life kind of fall short in the very fact that, the, that they're, they're not even believers throwing anchors off of boats, okay? These are unbelieving sailors, not Christians on board. Their action, let me ask you this, was it based on fear or faith? Oh, my. I mean, it makes it very clear. It says, and fearing less, we have fallen upon rocks. It's, it's all based on fear. I'm not saying right or wrong. I mean, if I was there, I'd be throwing anchors off too, Okay. So they did the right thing, but it was not based on, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to trust in God and make it through the night, and we're going to ride through the storm based on our faith and providence in God. No, nah, they were afraid. And they threw these anchors over, unbelieving. Um, um, what were they doing in verse number 30? I put that down there. Take a look at verse number 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under the color as they... Uh, as though they would have cast anchors out of the, uh, out of the foreship. And so, so they threw four anchors off the back, and they're like, hey, we're going to go throw some anchors off the front here. I mean, it's going to secure the ship a little bit better. And they were just trying to bail out. So that, boy, that really does a lot for a great sermon, doesn't it, on Christian faith? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the whole, the whole thing really just falls apart when you actually start reading the text. But... Um, this is, uh, this is the situation that they were in, and uh, this is not a sermon about, uh, um, about the anchors of the Christian, uh, Christian life. I mean, there's some great lessons throughout this text. As a matter of fact, if you trace through the whole text here of this, uh, the whole setting of Paul's, you know, as he's out to sea and all those type of things, you see, you, you, you see this building of confidence that Paul has in his life, the security that he feels it's not rooted in, you know, four anchors type of thing. It's rooted in the things that God has been speaking to him about, the visions that he had, the confidence that he knows that God wants him to be in Rome. And so that gives him a lot of security throughout all these turmoils that he's been going through. And so we've been speaking about these things for weeks now. Um, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, it, this wasn't, you know, here's this last ditch thing and he's got to like hang on until the end type of mentality. Paul knows very, he's, he's assured of the fact, God wants me to be in Rome. I am going to stand before Caesar. And I see what's going on around me, but I have a confidence of, because God said so. And I tell you, there's some real settledness that we can all have in our lives when we are rooted in the Word of God, have a confidence in God's promises, understand what, the God's, what God's will is in our life, and we're able to stand during many different difficult trials. We don't. We, it's not like this last ditch thing. We got to hang on through the night. Um, there's there's so much that goes on before Paul ever gets to this place where the ship's about ready to get battered and broken into pieces, where he has a strong confidence in God. And even though it's a very difficult situation, he's right where God wants him to be going through exactly what God wants him to go through, and he's feeling very confident that God's going to take him through it. It's a good thing. So, these, um, I don't have four anchors, but I have 276 reasons to care about how this voyage takes place. And, of course, that's based on verse number 37. If you drop down a little bit, it says, and, uh, and we were in, we were, uh, in all... Let me get this right. And we were in all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. So this is a big boat, and there's a lot of folks in there, and Paul cares about them. Um, as I said, Luke is with them. There's one other person who's a believer that's uh, listed uh, when they take off who's going to be with them. And... Um, and so it's just a small, small group of believers, and the rest of them, uh, I would just probably be very confident to say, unsaved. Um, 
Roman soldiers that are with him. This is not a, this is not a prison ship. Um, this is a ship that they kind of um, uh, found to take them across. And so they move the prisoners there. And there's many other folks there with them. Okay. So let's talk about what Paul is doing. And I, I read down verse number 29 and uh, we just read verse number 30 about the, the ships, uh, the, the seamen wanting to bail out. Um, and Paul says in verse number 31, Paul said to the centurion, to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. That's an interesting statement there. And so what he wants to do is, of course, keep the sailors on board. And, you know, certainly Paul trusts God, but he's also, he, he's not dumb. If, if here they are in a storm, and they, they're going to have to get this ship onto, they want to run it into the ground, and they want to beach it eventually come the morning. And, and so Paul knows we, we're going to need some sailors. We're going to need some experienced sailors on this boat. These guys want to bail out. And so Paul, although he trusts God, he's, he's, still, he's, he's still smart. He still understands we, we're going to need these, these seamen on board in order to get this, get this boat right where it needs to be. You know, God often, let me make it really clear, God often provides unsaved people in our lives that can actually provide assistance and help in the work of the ministry. That's a strange thing, but we do serve a God who is sovereign. We do serve a God that, that can take um, amazing um, opportunities in things that we would never consider. I mean, some of the, some of the big, big events in the life of the, of the nation of Israel, where you take like God taking an entire empire, like the Babylonian Empire, or the Assyrian Empire, or the Egyptian Empire, and using it to deal with his people, Israel, used the land of Egypt to raise up a nation. He went, they went down there as a little tribe of people, the descendants of Jacob, and they came out a nation because God used Egypt. You think, wow, look, a nation of Egypt. What a wicked place that was. It's always referred to in the Word of God as being that place where you just don't want to go down into Egypt. But yet God used it. God used Babylon. God used Nebuchadnezzar. I was reading uh, just text of scripture just the other day and talking about Cyrus, the release of the children of Israel after the Babylonian captivity and how God used that nation, the Medo-Persian Empire, to, to restore the nation of Israel. It's just amazing. And then you, you go into the New Testament, you read things like, for instance, Judas Iscariot, son of perdition. And yet God's plan of redemption required this betrayal and God, through his providence, works in this man's life in order to bring Christ to the place where he is offered up as a sacrifice for our sins. You know, God does some great things. Many of the testimonies been from folks serving in the work of the ministry of unsaved people that have provided resources for the ministry, places where uh, God's people have met. Often, uh, you know, for instance, you, a missionary gets into a house or a place of, uh, where, they, where they can meet at, and there's, you know, there's, there's a, an unsaved individual that owns a property and says, you know, I just, I just really feel inclined to, to let you guys use this, and I'll just kind of give you a break on the rent. And, and you think to yourself, you know, God must be really stirring in his heart. Well, maybe God is really stirring in his heart. Does he have to be saved in order for God to stir in his heart? And the answer to that is no. God does some mighty things. And he doesn't, it doesn't require someone to be truly born again in order for God to use them. And that, that's been told all throughout the scriptures and all throughout history. And so we just really, um, there's a text of scripture um, I had written down in my notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've read it, we've read it before. This is months ago, though, but Acts chapter 19. And um, 
This is when Paul was in Ephesus and that riot was going on. And, and uh, of course, Paul has, there, there's some disciples there. This is Acts chapter 19. And I'll start in verse number 30. Um, and when Paul would have entered into the, uh, uh, entered in unto the people, the, uh, the disciples suffered him not. So this is, uh, the, um, this outbreak has taken place in Ephesus. The, everyone kind of went into the amphitheater. Uh, that amphitheater is the ruins of that is still around today. If you want to go check it out someday, there uh, in in Asia Minor in Turkey, um, and they're there and they're they're chanting and and uh, Paul's thinking to himself, I I just I got to go in there. Uh, they're, they they've got a hold of some of the believers and and so he's concerned about them. But Paul thinks he's going Paul thinks he's going to fix things, right? The disciples say, No, nah, don't do it. You know, um, I let, let's go on. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends. Now, I've always found that phrase uh, intriguing because it kind of, it comes immediately after, um, you know, verse number 30, where it's talking about the disciples suffered him not. And then this other group of folks that are not listed as disciples. There's just folks that Paul has met along the way. You, 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 please remember, he's spent a couple years here in the city of Ephesus teaching and preaching evangelizing, he's met a lot of people, and he's made some friends. And I'm, I'm taking it from this text and the way that it's written that these friends are unsaved. And, and the Bible says, um, they sent unto him desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the, into the theater. So again, we have some unsaved folks, and I would, I would encourage you now to drop down with me a little bit. Verse number 35 and when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, ye men of Ephesus. And then he goes on and he gets everybody to chill out. The town clerk. Now, now of course, let me just say, the town clerk is not concerned about, uh, not necessarily concerned about Paul's ministry. He's not necessarily concerned about the believers that have been dragged into the theater uh, during this whole thing. Uh, his main concern is the fact that the, the Romans, uh, they had given the city of Ephesus a lot of leeway, a lot of freedoms to exercise and, and conduct their own business. Um, the Romans, um, you know, they, they have, you know, what they call, what's often called Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome. The peace of Rome is basically you know, guys with swords and spears saying, if you guys behave yourself, we won't mess with you and we'll be at peace, right? Yeah, uh, walk softly and carry a big stick. And so, um, but yet if, a, if, a, if an area is generally peaceful, they'll, they'll back the troops off and they say, you just guys do your own thing. Uh, they kept a lot of troops in Caesarea. They kept a lot of troops in Jerusalem all throughout Palestine, because the Jews, they never backed off. There was constant um, rebellion there. And so they kept a lot of troops there, but places like Ephesus wasn't that way. And so the town clerk says, we don't want to have such a problem that the Romans are going to send troops back in here. Do we, guys? And so this concern he has about that is going to be to the benefit of the believers. Paul's ministry, the disciples there, the church that's going to start in Ephesus. So did God use that town clerk? I'm assuming he's an unsaved man. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we'll see in heaven someday. He'll have a little badge that says Ephesus town clerk, you know, right there. Okay. My name is, I'm town clerk of Ephesus. But um, I'm assuming he's an unsaved man. But did God use him? Certainly. Is God going to use these sailors on this ship? And the answer to that is yet. I just want to, and my point is this. There are unsaved people that are part of your life. Maybe you've witnessed to them, maybe you have not. Maybe you've never even had the opportunities. But you'd be amazed what God can do with people in your life that, that are not believers. And you know you ought to thank God for them. Because God can use them to the benefit of the work of the ministry, just like he can use believers. Because that's just the way our, our God is able to do things. 
He is that, he is that sovereign. He, he can control so many things, all things. And, and so this is just, um, just a thought that not everybody that God uses to bless your life has to be a believer. Please notice that Paul, um, um, he's in the business not now of feeding folks. Verse number 33 and 34 back in our text, at Acts 27. Uh, we see, and while the day was uh, coming on, uh, Paul sought them all to take meat, saying, This day is, four, uh, is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And so, you know, here we see Paul um, serving up a meal. Now, please remember, there are 276 folks there. So we're talking about, um, you know, making sure a lot of people are fed. Uh, did he have to do that? Nope. Was it his job to do that? Nope. He was just took it upon himself to ministering to people. Um, you know, certainly Paul was a, was a preacher. He's an evangelist. He ministered um, through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. But you know, sometimes folks, what, uh, what they need is um, uh, requires um, some physical attention. And, and the work of the ministry does need to entail that sometimes. There are times that we must look to the very practical, physical needs of others because that is, is, that's where the need is. Um, just recently, I was reading Brother Noah George's uh, missions letter. I, um, I'm not sure if it's printed out yet or not, but uh, he talks a little bit about that. He's over in the country of Lebanon. Um, he's, he's mentioned that before, um, putting food uh, packages together. Uh, there's a lot of needs over there. Things are really rough. When the, you know, we complain about our inflation rate here, but their inflation rate is in the is in the four digits, okay, when you're talking about 1,000% increase in prices. It's just crazy. And so, um, you know, he mentions about some of the things that they're doing just try to physically minister to people. I remember years ago when Brother, uh, Brother Gary Kastner was in Chile, um, missionary, he was a missionary in Chile for many, many years, started several churches there. There was a, there was a horrible earthquake uh, just rocked the area where they were at. And uh, I remember uh, for months afterwards, um, he was asking for folks here in the States to send, financially send whatever they could because they were buying food and getting food out to some of these small villages and, and places. Because, you know, the, there's a, in a lot of countries, the, uh, the governmental infrastructure does not provide a reasonable amount of resources for folks that are in, in need. And that's, a, that's on a good day, Right. And so when a disaster hits, there's they got nothing. And, and so when you when you when you have the opportunity of ministering, sometimes that's what you do. Now certainly, um, when the gospel preaching takes a back seat to social welfare, then there's a problem. Okay, but there's always a need um, to minister to people, and sometimes that need requires some type of, of physical um, um, giving. I mean, sometimes it's food, sometimes it's other resources, materials, blankets, uh, things like that that we a lot of times just take for, to take for granted. Uh, and you go to some of these countries and they got, they got nothing. They got nothing. So, I mean, here's just a case. It's, a, again, very simple thing, but Paul, it's not his job. It's not his place. He's not to cook. He just, he, he, he's, at, he's at peace about the situation, and he's looking around going, you know, these folks haven't eaten for two weeks. They've been barely keeping this ship together. They've done everything they possibly can. And he's, and, he's, and he's thinking to himself, you know, this is, this is, tomorrow is it. You know, the sun's coming up and um, this is the last time we're going to be together on this boat. Let's sit down and have a meal together. And, and so, um, let, me, let me just say this as, as, uh, as clear as I can. You don't, you don't see a lot of preaching here. Paul's not up preaching, okay? 
but he was ministering. Lord Jesus Christ, when he saw groups of people that were coming to hear him preach, he had compassion on them. And he called his disciples and he said, I, I want to feed these folks. They've been with me a long time. And, I, you know, the, minute, the preaching part's over and they're going to they're gonna go off and, you know, they're, gonna, they're, they're hungry. Let's not, let's not send them away fasting. So, so even Jesus ministered in that, in that way. So there are times when ministers need to minister to some physical things that are going on in people's lives. And, and Paul just, he just illustrates it here. He takes a real servant's position and, and chooses to feed people. <clears throat> and a lot of people, let's just remind you, there is, uh, you know, 270 some folks and he's going to, He's going to make sure that they're taken care of. The last thing I want to mention tonight, and I said the feed, uh, I'm talking about feeding the body, but also meeting the needs of the soul. And you'll see in verse number 35, um, he said, And when they had uh, thus spoken, he took bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, um, he began to eat. Um, then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat, and we were all in the ship, 200, three score, and 16 souls. And so, you know, here you, here you see Paul, and um, again, um, he's not preaching. He is serving up, a, serving up a meal, making sure everybody, you know, basically tells everybody, let's just stop, and let's just take a breath, and let's eat. And... Um, you know, of course, he's praying. He's going he's to pray before he eats. Um, I don't know if you, um, um, you know, anytime that we're anywhere, you know, out at a restaurant or whatever, you know, we, we don't, I don't even think about it. We always just pray. I, I don't, it's not a matter of, you know, uh, there's no self-consciousness there. I don't even think about it anymore, about, you know, who's watching or anything like that. But, uh, you know, praying in public is, shouldn't be a big deal. You don't have to. You don't have to stand up in the middle of a restaurant and go, oh, God. And everybody goes, Wah! you know, you know, we don't do that. You know, we're just sitting around with the kids. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll pray together, you know. And, uh, you know, so Paul, I mean, he, he's not, you know, standing up there saying, everybody look this way. We're going to pray. You know, um, he just. As you can see there, he took the bread, he prayed, he began to eat, and everybody's like, yeah, what a great idea. Let's have, let's have something to eat, you know? And so he just did that. What a great testimony that is. And I just want to remind you that um, when you do pray in public, um, you, well, you don't know who's looking. You don't know anything like that. I don't, we don't, you shouldn't do it just to show off, and that's, that's not what it's about. Um, but uh, it is a good testimony. I just want to remind you of that. Um, no matter where you're at, uh, praying in public is always a good testimony. Um, but please notice the cheerfulness that, um, that follows that. Um, Paul really puts a lot of people at ease at, at that point. You know, there's a verse of Scripture that's, uh, of course, mostly quoted in reference to evangelism, and that's in Proverbs 11.30. Many of you could quote that. The first part of that verse, Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And, and so that term soul winner um, has kind of been, um, of course, extracted from that verse of Scripture and primarily used in the context of evangelism. And, and certainly there is something to be said about that. Uh, but I do want to remind you that the, when, you talk, when the Bible uh, talks about the soul, both Old Testament and New Testament, it is not always talking about the soul in reference to, you know, you got to save a soul. Your, your soul is the seat of your emotions and, and your inner, it's what makes you, you, okay? Uh, and so the winning of a soul is not necessarily talking about, always talking about evangelism. The winning of a soul is, is gaining the, um, the attention of, uh, of, of, someone's, uh, of someone's person. Their, uh, maybe it's their emotions or their feelings. It, it's, it would be kind of like, here's Paul standing there saying, hey, guys, you know, 
No one, no one's going to die tonight, fellas. Matter of fact, let's let's get, hey, let's get, let's get some food out of the galley. Everybody, come on up. Let's let's grab a bite to eat. He picks up. He's like, oh, Lord, thank you so much. You know, he breaks it, hands it. Luke's over there. His other buddies over there, and everybody's like, man. It, and they're sitting there thinking, there's something about this guy. And you'll notice it followed by this cheerfulness. You know, what Paul has done is he has, he's focused on these individuals and what their need is. They're needing this confidence and this understanding that everything's going to be okay. And um, he's got a hold of their soul. Let me remind you again, there's no evangelism going on here. Okay, Paul's going to have some opportunities when they get on the island to, to do some evangelism. All right. But um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a preaching thing going on here. It is just ministering to people, caring about people, letting them know that he cares about them, trying to instill some confidence in them. And, he, and by doing that, he really gets a hold of their souls. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a blessing as a child of God to have the type of relationship with others where... People are intrigued about your life. Uh, emotionally, it's like what it's like somebody saying, you know what, you know, Brother Stephen, when I'm around you, I just feel, I just feel so much at peace. You're just, your life is just so settled. You know, there are some people you're around that you're always on edge. You know? Do you know anybody like that? I know a few. Because their life is such a disaster, and they're so f- filled with friction. And, and, and every time you're around them, you just feel on edge. Okay, that person has not won your soul, okay? But there are others that you're around, it's like you're, you're, you're cheerful, you're at peace. You feel you're just settledness just for being in their presence. What you've done is you've won their soul. And, and so that relationship that you've established by having with Paul, he has this confidence about him. He has a careful, he cares for them. He's already expressed that care. Um, you remember all the way back in the beginning when he's saying, listen, if we, if we sail out of here, we're going to have some problems, you know. And, uh, you know, he didn't rub it in their face. He's like, well, you know, God's still in control. God met with me. I understand. God's going to get us through this. And... And he's still, he ha- he's just bringing that confidence with him. He's like, hey, listen, let's, we haven't eaten in a couple of weeks. Let's, let's all just have a meal together. And all of a sudden, everybody is cheerful. Uh, you know, that's certainly it should be our desire to share Christ and to minister to people and to let them know that they need Jesus. That is certainly something we need to do. But you know, our life doesn't have to be such a way that folks don't want to be around us. We, sh- we should have the type of life that captivates the souls of individuals and-, and brings into their lives an understanding that that we, as Christians, actually have something to offer to them that can make a difference. And winning their soul in that sense goes a long way to winning their souls in the sense that so often this verse is quoted as. And so this is what Paul has done here. They're cheered up. They, uh, he has a, there's, there's a confidence. Um, you know, they're looking at Paul saying, hey, listen, this guy's not freaking out. Um, certainly the opportunities to minister, to evangelize are going to come up. There's some things going to happen on this island. Um, but, the, but the understanding that they have is really based on the fact that Paul is, is confident of what God is doing in his life. And if you have that confidence, then, then you can really make a difference in people's lives. So what's going to happen next? If you've read the rest of the book, right? You know. Um, when the morning comes, that, that ship's going to run aground. So the sermon about the four anchors of the Christian life kind of, kind of falls apart when, they, when the ship breaks up. Okay? So if, you have, if, you're, if you're holding on to four anchors in your Christian life, be assured you're going to shipwreck. Okay? Just letting you know. 
Um, but Paul is, he's confident. He's instilled that confidence in others. And God's going to do some great things. The circumstance has not changed. It's still dreadful. I have never been on a, a, a ship that has crashed. Uh, I've never been through anything like this. The situation is dreadful. So the circumstances have not changed. As a matter of fact, you're, you're to the point where, you know, okay, this, this boat is going to wreck. Um, yet Paul goes into it understanding that God is in control. So there are times that God is going to put us in a position where the circumstances are dreadful. And yet his desire is not only for us to look to him and say, Lord, you're, you're in control of this. But he's also giving us the opportunity of taking that same confidence and looking at those that are around us and trying to instill that same confidence. It's not, it's not confidence in Paul, certainly not. But it's confidence in, in Paul's God. And, and that's what God has given us the opportunity to do. So the next time we're in the boat and the boat is sinking, we look to others and say, be of good cheer. I believe God. And that's what God has given us an opportunity to do. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord. It is good to know that you are in control of all things. And even amongst those that are unsaved, that you use um, whatever resource that you desire to minister and to help the work of the ministry to progress and, and even to encourage and help us. And so, Father, we're thankful for that. And Lord, I know there are so many times, Father, that we go through circumstances and we pray and ask you to, to change the circumstance. But yet, Father, you're desiring to change us through those circumstances. And Lord, I, I do want to ask you, please, if there's any of your children here tonight that are going through some storms, oh, dear Father, help them to be a good cheer. Help them, Father, to help, help others to ride through that storm with great cheer. And Father, I pray that you would instill a confidence in their life that you are in control. And Lord, I ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Inspire.